Chapter One of the Silver Bullet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer, San Antonio, Texas. The Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. The House in the Pine Wood. We had better lie down and die," said Robin peevishly. I can't go a step further, and to emphasize his words, he deliberately sat. Infernal little duffer, growled Herrick. Hmm. Might have guessed you would, Joyce. He threw himself down beside his companion and continued grumbling. You have tobacco, a fine night, and a heather couch of the finest, yet you talk as though the world were coming to an end. I'm sure there's more will never end, sighed Joyce, reminded of his cigarettes. We've been trudging it since eight in the morning, yet it still stretches to the back of beyond. Hey! The pedestrians were pronouncedly isolated. A moonless sky, thickly jeweled with stars, arched over a treeless moor, far stretching as the plain of Shinar. In the luminous summer twilight the eye could see for a moderate distance, but to no clearly defined horizon and the verge of sight was limited by vague shadows, hardly definite enough to be mists. The more exhaled the noonday heats in thin white vapors, which shut out from the external world those who nestled to its bosom. Sense of solitude, the brooding silence, the formless surroundings, and above all, the insistence of the infinite, would have appealed on ordinary occasions to the poetical and superstitious side of Robin's nature. But at the moment his nerves were uppermost. He was worn out, fractious as a child, and in his helplessness could have cried like one. Herrick knew his friend's frail physique, and inherited neurosis. Therefore he forbore to make bad worse by ill-advised sympathy. Judiciously waiting until Joyce had in some degree soothed himself with tobacco, he talked of the commonplace. Nine o'clock, said he, peering at his watch. Thirteen hours walking. Nothing to me, Robin, but a goodish stretch to you. However, we are within hail of civilization, and in England. A few miles further, we'll pick up a village of some sorts, no doubt. One would think you were exploiting Africa the way you howl. He spoke thus callously, in order to brace his friend, but Joyce resented the tone with that exaggerated sense of injury peculiar to the neurotic. "'I am no Hercules like you, Jim,' he protested sullenly. "'All your finer feelings have been blunted by beef and beer. You can't feel things as I do. Also,' continued Robin, still more querulously, "'it seems to have escaped your memory that I returned only last night from a two-day visit to town. If you will break up your holiday into fragments, you must not expect to receive the benefits its enjoyment as a whole would give you. It was jolly enough last week, sauntering through the Midlands, till you larked up to London, and fagged yourself with its detestable civilization. Joyce threw aside his cigarette and nervously began to roll another. It was no lark which took me up, Jim. The letter that came to Southbury Inn was about her business. Sorry, old man, I keep forgetting your troubles. Heat and the want of food makes me savage. We'll rest here for a time, and then push on. Not that a night in the open would matter to me." Joyce made no reply, but lying full length on the dry herbage, stared at the scintillating sky. At his elbow, Herrick, cross-legged like a fakir, gave himself up to the enjoyment of a disreputable pipe. The more highly strung man considered the circumstances which had placed him where he was. Two months previously, Robin Joyce had lost his mother, to whom he had been devotedly attached, and the consequent grief had made a wreck of him. For weeks he had shut himself up in the flat, once brightened by her presence to luxuriate in woe. He possessed, in a large degree, that instinct of martyrdom, latent in many people, which searches for sorrow as a more joyous nature hunts for pleasure. The blow of Mrs. Joyce's death had fallen unexpectedly, but it brought home to Robin the knowledge, strange as it may sound, 
that a mental pleasure can be plucked from misfortune. He locked himself in his room, wept much, and ate little, neglected his business of contributor to several newspapers, and his personal appearance. Thus the pain of his loss merged itself in that delight of self-mortification, which must have been experienced by the hermits of the Theobald. Not entirely from religious motives was the desert made populous with hermits in the days of Cyril and Hypatia. Herrick did not realize this transcendental indulgence, nor would he have understood it had he done so. Emphatically a sane man, he would have deemed it a weakness degrading to the will, if not a species of lunacy. As it was, he merely saw that Robin yielded to an unrestrained grief detrimental to his health, and insisted upon carrying him off for a spell in the open air. With less trouble than he had anticipated, Robin's consent was obtained. The mourner threw himself with ardor into the scheme, selected the county of Berks as the most inviting for a ramble, and when fairly started, showed a power of endurance amazing in one so frail. Jim, however, being a doctor, was less astonished than a layman would have been. He knew that in Joyce a tremendous nerve power dominated the feebler muscular force, and that the man would go on like a blood horse until he dropped from sheer exhaustion. The collapse on the moor did not surprise him. He only wondered that Robin had held out for so many days. "'But I wish you had not gone to London,' said Herrick, pursuing aloud this train of thought. "'I had to go,' replied Joyce, not troubling to query the remark. "'The lawyer wrote about my poor mother's property. In my sorrow, I had neglected to look after it. But at Southbury Junction, feeling better, thanks to your open-air cure, I thought it wise to attend to the matter. Then Joyce went on to state, with much detail, how he had caught the Paddington Express at Marley, their last stopping place, and had seen his lawyer. The business took some time to settle, but it resulted in the knowledge that Joyce found himself possessed of five hundred a year in consuls. Also the flat and the furniture, said Robin. So I am not so badly off. I can devote myself wholly to novels now and shall not have to rack my brains for newspaper articles. Herrick nodded over a newly filled pipe. Did you sleep at the flat? No, I went up on Tuesday, as you know, and slept that night at the Hull Hotel, a small house in one of the Strand side streets. Last night I joined you at Southbury. And it is now Thursday, said Herrick, laughing. How particular you are to detail, Robin. Well, Southbury is a goodish way behind us now, and Saxon is our next resting place. Feel better? Yes, thanks. In another quarter of an hour I shall make the attempt to reach Saxon. But we are so late. I fear no bed. Oh, that's all right. We can wake the landlord. I calculate we have only three miles. Quite enough, too. By the way, Jim, what did you do when I left you? In the semi-darkness Herrick chuckled. "'Fell in love,' said he. "'Hm. You lost no time about it. And she?' "'A daughter of the gods, divinely tall, dark hair, creamy skin, sea-blue eyes, the figure and gait of Diana, and—' "'More of the Celt than the Greek,' interrupted Joyce. "'Blue eyes, black hair. That is the Irish type. Where did you see her?' "'In Southbury Church, talking to a puny curate, who did not deserve such a companion.' Oh, Robin, her voice like a Aeolian harp. It must possess a variety of tones, then, Jim. Did she see you? Herrick nodded and laughed again. She looked and blushed. Beauty drew me with a single hair. Therefore, I thrilled responsive. Love at first sight, Robin. Hi-ho, never again shall I see this Helen of Marley. Live in hope, said Joyce, springing to his feet. Allons, mon ami. The more leisurely Herrick rose, markedly surprised at this sudden recuperation. Wonderful man, one minute you are dying, the next skipping like a two-year-old. Hysterical all the same, he added, as Joyce laughed. Those three miles, explained the other feverishly, I feel that I have to walk them, and my determination is braced to breaking point. That means you'll collapse halfway, retorted the doctor, unstrapping his knapsack. 
Light a match. Valerian, for you, my man. Robin made no objection. He knew the value of valerium for those unruly nerves of his, at present vibrating like so many harp strings twanged by an unskilled player. His small white face looked smaller and whiter than ever in the faint light of the match, but his great black eyes flamed like wind-blown torches. The contrast of Herrick's sun-tanned Saxon looks struck him as almost ludicrous. Joyce needed no mirror to assure him of his appearance at the moment. He knew only too well how he aged on the eve of a nerve storm. For the present it was averted by the Valerian, but he knew, and so did Herrick, that sooner or later it would surely come. "'We must get on as fast as possible,' said Herrick, the knapsack again on his broad back. "'Food, drink, rest. You need all three. Forward!' For some time they walked on in silence. Robin was so small. Dr. Jim so large that they looked like the giant and the dwarf of the old fairy tale on their travels. But in this case it was the giant who did all the work. Joyce was a pampered, lazy, irresponsible child, in the direct line of descent from Harold Skimpole. If Jim Herrick must be likened to another hero of romance, Amias Lee was his prototype. The shadows melted before them, and closed in behind, and still there was nothing but plain and mist. At the end of two miles a dark bulk, like a thundercloud, loomed before them. It stretched directly across their path. "'Boogie!' laughed Robin. "'A wood,' said the more prosaic Jim. "'This moor is fringed with pine woods. Remember the forest we passed through this morning?' "'In the cheerful sunshine,' shuddered Joyce. I don't like woodlands by night. The fairies are about, and the goblins of the worst. Ha! Yonder, the lantern of Puck. Oberon holds revel in the wood. Puck must be putting a girdle around the earth, then, Robin, said Herrick, and stared at a white starry light, which beamed above the trees. He cats torch, cried Joyce, a meeting of witches, and he began to chant the gruesome rhymes of the sisterhood as Macbeth heard them. The scene is a blasted heath, too, said he. By this time the moon was rising, and the silver shafts struck inward to the heart of the pines. The aerial light vanished behind the leafy screen, as the travelers came to a halt on the verge of the undergrowth. We must get through, said Dr. Jim, or if you like, Robin, we can skirt round. Saxon Village is just beyond, I fancy. Let us choose the bee-line, murmured Joyce. I want a bed and a meal as soon as possible. This part of the world is unknown to me. You lead. I don't know it myself. However, here is a path. We'll follow it to the light. That comes from a tower of sorts, too high up for a house. With Herrick as pioneer, they plunged into the wood, following a winding path. In the gloom, their heads came in contact with boughs and tree trunks, but occasionally the moon made radiant the secret recesses, and revealed unexpected openings. The path sometimes passed across the glade, and on the sward, of which Joyce declared he saw the fairies dancing, and anon plunged into a Sumerian gloom, suggestive of the underworld. No wind swung the heavy pine boughs. The wild creatures of the wood gave no sign, made no stir. Yet the explorers heard a low, persistent swish swir swish like the murmur of a dying breeze it came from no particular direction but droned on all sides without pause without change of note herrick heard robin's hysterical sob as the insistent sound bored into his brain he would have made some remark but at the moment they emerged into an open space of considerable size here ringed by pines loomed a vast gray house with a slim tower in that tower burned the steady light, outshining even the moon's luster. But what was more remarkable still was the illumination of the mansion. Every window radiated white fire. Queer, said Robin, halting on the verge of the wood. Not even a fence or a wall, a path or an outhouse. One would think that this was an inferior Aladdin's palace, dropped here by some negligent genie. All ablaze, too, he added wonderingly. The owner must be given a ball. No signs of guests anyhow, returned Herrick, 
as puzzled as his companion. Hmm. Queer thing to find Versailles in a pine wood. However, it may afford us a bed and a supper. It was certainly strange. The circle of trees stopped short of a building at fifty yards. On all sides stretched an expanse of shorn and well-kept turf, pathless as the sea. In its midst, the mansion was dropped, as Joyce aptly put it, unexpectedly. A two-story Tudor building with battlements and mullioned windows, terraces and flights of shallow steps, the whole weather worn and gray in the moonlight, overgrown with ivy and distinctly ruinous. The dilapidated state of the house contrasted in a rather sinister manner with the perfectly kept lawn. Also another curious contrast was the tower. This tacked on to the western corner stood like a lean white ghost watching over its earthly habitation. Its gleaming stone work and sharp outlines showed that it had been built within the last decade, a distinct anachronism, which marred the quaint antiquity of the medieval mansion. He must be an astrologer, said Joyce, referring to the owner, or it may be that the tower is an inland pharaoh to guide travelers across that pathless moor. Another horrible place, he muttered. Why horrible? asked Dr. Jim, as they crossed the lawn. Robin shuddered and cast a backward glance. I can hardly explain, but to my mind, there is something sinister in this lonely mansion, ablaze with light, yet devoid of inhabitants. We have yet to find out if that is the case, Robin. Hello. The door is open, and in the strong moonlight they looked wonderingly at each other. The heavy door, oak, clamped with iron, was slightly ajar. Herrick bent upon consummating the adventure, pushed it slightly open. They beheld a large hall with a tessellated pavement, and stately columns. Between these last stood black oak, high-backed chairs, upholstered in red velvet. Also, statues of Greek gods and goddesses, holding aloft opaque globes, radiant with light. A vast marble staircase, with wide and shallow steps, sloped upwards, and on either side of this, from the height of the landing, fell scarlet velvet curtains, shutting in the hall. The whiteness of the marble, the crimson of the draperies, the brilliance of the light, these sumptuous furnishings amazed the dusty pedestrians. It was as though, on a lonely prairie, one should step suddenly into the splendors of the Vatican. "'The palace of the sleeping beauty,' whispered the awestruck Robin. "'Who can say romance is dead?' when one can stumble upon such an adventure. Herrick shared Robin's perplexity, but of a more practical nature. He addressed himself less to the romance than to the reality. Seeing no one, hearing nothing, he touched an ivory button. That glimmered a white spot beside the door. Immediately a silvery succession of sounds shrilled through the apparently lonely house. Electric bells, electric light, the hermit of this establishment is up to date. He's also deaf and has no servants, said Joyce impatiently after a few minutes had passed. Has a Borgian banquet taken place here? The guests seem to be dead. Hi! The whole thing is damnable. Don't let yourself go, said the doctor roughly, squeezing the little man's arm. Wait and see the upshot. Again and again they rang the bell, and themselves heard its imperative summons but no one appeared. Then they took their courage in both hands and stepped into the house. Passing through the crimson curtains, they found themselves in a wide corridor, enameled green, with velvet carpet and more light-bearing statues. On either side were doors draped with emerald silk. Herrick led the way through one of these, for Joyce, rendered timorous by the adventure, would not take the initiative. In the first room, an oval table was set out for a solitary meal. The linen was bleached as the alpine snow, the silver antique, the crystal exquisite, the porcelain worth its weight in gold. An iridescent glass vase in the center was filled with flowers, but these drooped, withered, and brown. The bread was also stale. The fruits were shriveled from their early freshness, magnificently furnished and draped, the room glowed in splendor, under innumerable electric lights. But the intruders had eyes only for the sumptuous table, 
with its air of desolation and its place set for one. Anything more sinister can scarcely be conceived. No one has sat down to this meal, said Herrick, lifting the covers of the silver dishes. It has stood here for hours, if not for days. Let us see if we can find the creature for whom it was intended. Perhaps you expect to find the beast that loved beauty, since you call him a creature, said Robin, hysterically. Here is wine. Dr. Jim went to the sideboard, whereupon were ranged decanters of Venetian glass containing many different vintages. Passing over these, he selected a pint bottle of champagne. We must make free of our position, he said, unwiring this. Afterwards, we can apologize. Ugh, cried Robin, as the cork popped with a staccato sound in the silence. How gruesome. Give me a glass at once, Jim. I don't know if it is good for you in your present state, replied the doctor, brimming a goblet. However, the whole adventure is so queer that an attack of nerves is excusable. Drink up. Robin did so and was joined by Jim. They finished the bottle and felt exhilarated and more ready to face the unknown. Again Herrick led the way to further explorations. Adjacent to the dining room, they discovered a small kitchen, white tiled and completely furnished. Our hermit cooks for himself, declared Dr. Jim, eyeing the utensils of polished copper. This is not a servant's kitchen. Also, it is off the dining room. Robin made no reply, but followed his friend, his large eyes becoming larger at every fresh discovery. They entered a drawing-room filled with splendid furniture, silver knick-knacks, costly china, and eastern hangings of great price. There was a library stored with books in magnificent bindings, and with tables piled with latter-day magazines, novels, and newspapers. Our hermit keeps himself abreast of the world, commented Jim. Then came a picture gallery, but this was on the second story and lighted from the roof. Treasures of art, ancient and modern, glowed here under the radiance of the light, which illuminated every room. A smoking room, fashioned like a ship's cabin, a Japanese apartment, crammed with the lacquer work, and stiff embroideries of Yedo and Yokohama. A shooting gallery, a bowling alley, a music room, containing a magnificent irad. Finally, a dozen bedrooms furnished with taste and luxury. To crown all, they discovered a gymnasium, fitted up completely even the foils and boxing gloves, and a huge bathroom. This last was throughout of white marble, with a square pool of water in the center. What a pond to bathe in, cried Jim enviously, for he was hot and dusty. Our hermit is an ancient Roman. He understands how to enjoy life. Come along, Robin. By this time they had explored almost the whole of the wonderful house. There remained the back premises, but on entering they found nothing but darkness and dirt, squalor and coldness. The hermit's attention to his mansion stopped short at the servant's door. And I don't believe he has any servants, declared Joyce. How the deuce does he keep all this clean? The doctor shook his head. He hardly knew what to say. The situation was beyond him. A palace in the wilderness, with an open door inviting thieves, crammed with treasures, brilliant with light, uninhabited, deserted. Was there ever anything so wonderful? He had to pinch himself to make sure that he was awake. We have got into the world of the fourth dimension, the fairyland of the Arabian Nights. What do you think, Joyce? I think we had better climb up to the tower, said Robin, with unusual common sense. It is the only place we have left unexplored. There's a light there, too. Aladdin may be aloft. Herrick shook his head. He would have heard the bell. However, come along. We must find someone. With some difficulty, they discovered the staircase leading to the tower. It was narrow but straight, not so steep as might have been expected. At the top, Herrick, leading as usual, was confronted by a closed door of plain deal. It was not locked, however and having knocked without receiving a reply, he opened it. Joy set his heels, peeped over his shoulder, and beheld a small square room with windows on all four sides, and a large central globe burning in the ceiling. In contrast to the rest of the house, this room was absolutely bare, blank walls, 
Chinese matting on the floor, a camp bedstead in one corner, a deal table without a covering in another, and two cane chairs. No anchorite could have had a more ascetic cell. Herrick took in the scene at a glance, took in also its, to him, central feature, the body of a man lying face downward near the bed. Joyce saw the corpse also, and remained at the door, shaking and white. Murder or suicide, Jim asked himself, as he turned over the dead. That which had once been a man was in evening dress, in the finest of linen and jewelry, the most immaculate of clothes. It lay under the scrutinizing eye of Dr. Herrick, a lean, evil face with a hooked nose, scanty gray hair cut short, and a long mustache carefully trimmed. The left hand gripped the revolver. The shirt front over the heart was covered with blood, and a stream, coagulated and black, streaked the matting. "'In God's name!' cried Joyce, not daring to enter. "'What is it?' "'It was once the owner of this house, I suppose,' said Herrick, grimly. "'Now it is a piece of carrion. Suicide, apparently. Dead over twenty-four hours. Shot through the heart. A steady hand to do that. Hmm. Left-handed, too. Is it suicide or murder?' "'Here's a damnable discovery to cap the adventure,' said Dr. Jim, gravely. From the doorway came a gasp, a tittering laugh. Jim had just time to spring forward when Joyce lunged into his arms. The long-expected nerve storm had come at last. End of Chapter One Chapter Two of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. De mortius nil nisi malum. And sunset fire, the Saxon spire, my guidepost unto heaven. So sang midway in the last century a local poet, who died long since and passed poems and all into oblivion but the famous spire in its copper sheathing still catches the sunlight and glows at the center of Saxon, a veritable pillar of fire. Those natives who have emigrated, enlisted as soldiers, taken situations in London and elsewhere, shipped before the mast, as some have done, always remember church and spire. The children recall its ruddy blaze when they read Exodus. Saxon was not a large place. It might have contained a couple of hundred inhabitants, probably less, and these principally agricultural laborers. They worked on the farms and estates which dotted the vast alluvial plain stretching, stretching to Beerominster. As the city, like that one mentioned in the Bible, it is set upon a hill. The twin towers of the cathedral and the Bishop Gandalf's spire can easily be seen from Saxon, but the villagers prefer their own spire and their own parson, rarely venturing the three miles to Beominster. Those who do go always return to their beloved hamlet, more convinced than ever as to the superiority of their birthplace. A sturdy, stubborn set of rustics, these men and women of Saxon. The topography of the country has set down in Herrick's map showed that Saxon was almost the center of the district, taking Beerominster as the real devil. The great plain was covered with many such hamlets, each clustering around its parent church, but Saxon was the nearest to the city. Far away on the other side was Smoky Iron Grip, the manufacturing town, and also in sight of Marley and Heathcroft, then sixteen miles across Southbury Heath, which Herrick and Joyce had so wearily trodden on the previous night. Southbury Junction roared with perpetual traffic from here. The great main line tapped the local railway, which converged from all points. The pine woods sheltering Saxon from the chill winds of the moor also barred it from the outside world, as Southbury was considered to be. Saxon, with its neighboring hamlets, claimed to belong solely to Beerominster. The folks would have called themselves autochthonous had they known of such a word and its meaning. The plan of the village was simple. In its center 
was a genuine village green, with a queen cunts of immemorial elms. From this ran four streets through the mass of houses, until they passed beyond them altogether and out into the country. On one side stands St. Edith's Church, in a nest of trees, and on the other the Carr Arms, an inn of undoubted antiquity. The remaining two sides are occupied by rows of medieval-looking houses, inhabited by those whom Saxon calls the best people, by which is meant the tradesmen. There was no doctor or lawyer, and the rector representing the gentry in the village itself dwelt on its outskirts. The country people lived outside the village on their estates, and visited only on business, and as there were no radicals in Saxon, these were looked upon as more than mortal. Under the red-tiled roof of the car arms, Robin Joyce was still sleeping the next morning, when the green was filled with excited people talking of the murder, so they called it. The event of the previous night had so shaken the nerve of the little man that it was all Herrick could do to get him out of that ghastly mansion and down to the inn. Dr. Jim, rousing the landlord, had told his story, and after seeing Robin to bed, had turned in himself. What did it matter to him that the great house was still ablaze in the pine wood, still filled with precious things, and its doors and windows opened to thieves? He was too tired almost to think, and the moment his head was on the pillow, he fell into a heavy, dreamless slumber, which lasted until ten the next morning. From this much-needed rest he was awakened by Napper, the landlord, a burly man, with a ruddy face suggestive of beef and beer in large quantities. In no very pleasant humor, Jim sat up, to demand with a growl and an adjective what was wanted. On being informed that Mr. Inspector Bridge, of Barrowminster waited to see him, the events of the night came back on a still drowsy brain with a rush. Thoroughly awakened, he promised to be down in half an hour, and forthwith tumbled into the largest cold bath Napper could provide. After a douche and ten minutes of gymnastics, the doctor hurried in the clean shirt and his homespun suit. While he dressed, he meditated on the fact that Napper had lost no time in telling the police what had happened. In a few minutes he looked into Robin's bedroom, finding his companion still in an exhausted slumber. He went downstairs alone to face the officer. Inspector Bridge was a tall, lean man with a serious face and, what was surprising, taking in conjunction with his funeral looks, a jocular manner. The man's humor lurked in his eyes, a gray pair of twinklers, which belied the turned-down corners of his mouth. His movements were slow, his tone was brisk and businesslike, rather a contradictory personality. Herrick thought, and concluded that Bridge resembled nothing so much as an undertaker out for a holiday. His profession would thus account for the solemnity and the slowness, and the holiday explained his brisk jocularity. The incongruous officer considered the young man with a pursed-up mouth and a humorous eye. He saw that Herrick was a gentleman, and this opinion being confirmed in the inspector's mind by the sight of a signet ring, he treated him with more deference than he had been prepared to show. Napper's report of the pedestrian had led Bridge to infer that they were of the genus Tramp. "'Good morning, sir,' began the inspector genially. "'I have come to see you about this murder of Colonel Carr. "'My card, Mr. Mr.' "'Dr. Herrick,' said Jim, glancing at what he profanely called the official ticket. "'Have you breakfasted, Mr. Inspector? "'If not, or if you have, it really doesn't matter. "'Take the meal with me. "'I must eat before I can talk.' "'Bridge was only too willing, and Herrick, went up several degrees in his good opinion. Napper can cater excellently, said he, rubbing his hands. I have often tested his hospitality. Dr. Jim privately thought that the inspector was not averse to testing anyone's hospitality. But the man seemed decent enough, and Herrick was sufficiently worldly-wise 
to make himself agreeable to Jack in office. In another half hour the two were seated in a pleasant parlor before a well-spread table. Bridge performed wonders in the way of eating. How he could remain lean with such an appetite was a wonder to Jim. But the doctor himself was not far behind, and between the two of them they swept the table clean. Then Herrick lighted his pipe, ensconced himself in a chintz-covered armchair near the window, and prepared to answer the inspector's questions before asking several of his own. At the outset, Bridge detailed all that had been done up to that moment. Three policemen were looking after the pines, so was the house called, and guarding the dead. A doctor was expected from Beerminster to inspect the body. The coroner to attend to the inquest, and the relatives of the deceased had been notified. Then Mr. Inspector put Herrick through a stiff examination, and took down all he said. When the officer was quite satisfied and his notebook was full, Jim proceeded to make inquiries on his own account. The strangeness of the whole affair roused his curiosity, and, as Bridge pleasantly observed, he showed marked symptoms of detective fever. This was the first time Jim had stumbled across the disease. The dead man was called Colonel Carr, asked Dr. Herrick, crossing his legs. The inspector nodded. A well-known county name, said he. Wilford Lloyd Carr. You can see it in Burke's landed gentry. But what you will not see, added Bridge, with a dry cough, is the name he was known by hereabouts. Wicked Colonel Carr, sir. That is what every man, woman, and child called him. Not without reason, doctor. Hmm. It does sound as though he had a bad reputation. Bad, sir? echoed the inspector, not without pride. A regular out-and-out -out rip. But that he belonged to the gentry, he would have been through my hands, I can tell you. And to think of him being murdered. I ain't astonished, though I ain't astonished. He was too wicked to die in his bed, as the Christian he wasn't. Why do you say he was murdered? asked Jim alertly. The revolver was in his hand. Looks like suicide to me, at the first glance, of course. Bridge laughed grimly and shook his head. Colonel Carr was the last man in the world to take his own life, sir. Too much afraid of the burning pit for that. I examined the body this morning, and I say murder. Certainly my examination was cursory. But if he had shot himself through the heart, the linen over it would have been scorched. There is no mark of powder, not even a singe. No, sir, that shot was fired at long range. If you did not alter the position of the body, Dr. Herrick, I should say that the shot had been fired from the door. I did not alter the position of the body, Mr. Inspector. I merely turned it over and replaced it. Hmm, murder, you say? And the assassin placed the revolver in the dead man's hand to hint at suicide? Clever man or woman, Mr. Inspector, which? Lord knows, replied Bridge, rubbing his gray hair. The colonel had heaps and heaps of enemies, I can tell you. Whether man or woman, I do not know. But I'll tell you one thing, Dr. Herrick. Whosoever fired that shot knew the colonel excellently well. I see what you mean. The assassin knew that his victim was left-handed. Yes, sir, you hit it. Now, added Bridge meditatively, could it have been Frisco? Frisco? Who was he or her? Frisco was a servant of Colonel Carr, explained the inspector, and as great a mystery as his master. San Francisco, he called himself, and that, I take it, is the name of a town. The wicked colonel shortened it to Frisco for short. Yes, Frisco might have killed him. If you would only give me a concise biography of Carr, I should be less in the dark, Mr. Inspector. Oh, you'll hear plenty of stories about him, none of them credible. But to put all you need to know at present into a nutshell, I can only say that the wicked colonel returned here from foreign parts ten years ago. He built that tower and shut himself up to live the life of a recluse. He brought Frisco with him, and the two inhabited that house all alone. No one thought of going near it. Ah, that is why the crime was not discovered earlier? Certainly, doctor. 
the milkman the baker and the butcher were always instructed to leave their goods in a porch at the side of the house in that porch added bridge we have found two days provisions today is friday last night when you discovered the body was thursday and the provisions for that day and wednesday were untouched hmm. so carr was alive on tuesday i believe doctor that he was murdered on tuesday night according to napper frisco was drinking here on that evening and spoke ill of his master carr must have been alive then if frisco killed him he would leave saxon on tuesday night therefore the provisions for wednesday and thursday would not be taken in did not the baker and the rest suspect anything when they found two days provisions untouched lord bless you no said bridge jovially the wicked colonel was that queer that nothing he did seemed strange well said jim after a pause from what you tell me it seems likely that this man frisco knows something of the murder if he did not commit it himself can't you find him there's no sign of the man sir what about his appearance a stout sailor that's what he looks like said bridge reflecting red hair and blue eyes an american way of speaking and a cross on his forehead right above the nose a cross what do you mean a scar sir a criss-cross slashed with a knife frisco said he got it in south america but I don't rightly know how. Frisco could be secret if he liked, even in his cups, and he could drink rum by the bucket. Have you set the detectives after him? Not yet. I'm waiting for the inquest to be held. It takes place today at the Pines. You will be there, Dr. Herrick, and your friend? Certainly, but my friend can tell you no more than I can. If I were you, though, Mr. Inspector, I should certainly seek out this Frisco man at once. What is his real name? I don't know, nor anyone else, sir. He was a mystery, I tell you. As to be looking him up, I like to do things in an orderly manner. First the inquest, and all the available evidence, sir. Then we shall see. Herrick shrugged his broad shoulders. It was not his business to instruct Bridge but it seemed to him foolish to delay hunting for this mysterious Frisco. The man might be innocent, but on the face of it there appeared to be a strong suspicion against him. Men do not disappear without some reason, and as Frisco was gone, leaving a dead body behind him, it looked as though terror had winged his heels. His reason could resolve themselves into only one of two things, either he had murdered his master himself and had fled to avoid the consequences, or he knew who had committed the crime and, intimidated by the assassin, had made himself scarce. While Herrick was turning over the situation in his own mind, a knock came to the door. Immediately afterwards, a girl entered. She was a slip of a thing who looked about nineteen, slim and well set up. Her face was oval and thin and burnt red by wind and sun. Herrick had never seen before hair of such glorious red. It resembled ruddy gold, and was wreathed in burnished coils around her well-shaped head. This young lady had eyes of a sapphire blue, and a firm set mouth. Dressed in a navy serge, plainly made, with a linen collar, a brown leather belt, and gauntlet gloves, she looked trig and neat a girl likely to be passed over in a crowd until one looked into her wonderful eyes. The soul that looked out of them proved she was a woman of no common intelligence. Her manner was refined and well-bred. She was remarkably cool, and after a shrewd glance at Herrick, addressed herself to the inspector. "'I beg your pardon for interrupting you,' she said in a brisk but not unmusical voice. "'This inquest, Mr. Inspector.' It takes place at the Pines this afternoon, Miss Endicott, replied Bridge, who seemed to know her well. But surely, Miss, you will not attend? Certainly, Mr. Bridge, I do the copy for the Chronicle. Besides, poor Colonel Carr was my friend, and I want to hear the truth about his death. Herrick looked sharply at the only person he had heard speak sympathetically of the dead man. There lives 
some soul of good in all things evil he quoted and a flash of the girl's teeth showed that she perfectly understood oh i know that everyone speaks ill of the colonel said she a trifle sadly he was bad enough no doubt yet your quotation applies to him more than the gossip about him would lead you to suppose here she glanced at bridge not so much to emphasize the fact that he talked ill of the dead as to invite an introduction bridge was quick to see her real meaning this is dr herrick who found the body said he and this lady doctor is miss bess endicott who reports for the bureau minster weekly chronicle jim was a trifle surprised and disappointed to find that this charming young lady occupied such a position though why he should have been either he could not explain even to himself however he bowed with a smile and received the same courtesies in return miss endicott's eyes rested approvingly on his splendid figure this is what i call a man they seemed to say but with her tongue she uttered quite different sentiments i'm glad to meet you dr herrick she said gracefully you must tell me all about your discovery that is you do not mind my making copy out of you not at all responded herrick eagerly i am accustomed to be made copy of my friend mr joyce who is at present upstairs asleep is a literary man i am quite hand and glove with the guild i assure you in that case we must be friends said miss endicott frankly mr joyce was with you last night unfortunately yes miss endicott he's a nervous man and not strong i'm sorry to say that the terrible sight upset him all the good i hoped he would obtain from this walking tour has disappeared are you on a walking tour asked bridge who was putting on his cap yes for the last fortnight we have been tramping over the country the last place we stopped at was southbury then we crossed the heath to stumble on this disagreeable adventure why do you smile miss endicott the girl flushed a trifle i've heard of you of me jim stared but i am not known in this part of the country my dear lady have we met before somehow your face seems familiar it would be more familiar if i were two inches taller and had dark hair said miss endicott with an amused look if you will stare at ah interrupted jim eagerly i remember now the lady i saw talking to the little curate in southbury church was my sister replied the girl when you mentioned southbury i remembered that she mentioned how you stared at her and described your appearance then i recognized you i hope your sister did not think me rude said jim rather confused but the fact is she is so i know interrupted miss bess composedly ida is accustomed to admiration but this is not business she added turning to bridge well what's to be done now mr inspector nothing can be done until the inquest is held he replied going towards the door but i recommend you miss bess to interview this gentleman he can tell you much that will be of interest to your readers the inspector slipped out with a laugh and miss endicott turned her sparkling eyes on dr herrick i hope you won't think me a nuisance she said hesitatingly but if you could only too pleased said jim placing a chair what is it you wish to know miss endicott all about yourself and your friend and the walking tour and the discovery thus far she rattled on blithely but then flushed and stammered please do not think me rude she murmured in my present capacity i am simply a machine for the bureau mr chronicle if you do not wish to tell me anything i have not the slightest objection replied jim laughing do you object to my smoking i can answer your questions better if i smoke please do cried miss endicott eagerly i am used to it my brother frank is never without a pipe in his mouth your brother and i should got on well together then said herrick artfully not that he wanted to meet the brother so much as the beautiful sister of southbury church however this interview miss bess 
as the inspector called her, pulled out a pocketbook and became the reporter at once. She was versed in her profession and put the shrewdest of questions. All the same, she appeared to be nervous at times, and Herrick guessed that it was an innately refined woman struggling with the necessary obtrusiveness of the breadwinner. However, he did his best to put her at ease, and told his story as concisely as possible. "'My name is James Calthrop Herrick,' he said. "'I'm a doctor, supposed to be practicing in West Kensington, London. My friend Joyce was one of my patients, is, I should say. He lost his mother and fell ill. By the way, you need not put that down, Miss Endicott. All you need to let your readers know is that Mr. Joyce and myself have been on a walking tour and stumbled, as I said before, on the pines and the body. After which statement, Herrick detailed the arrival at the lighted house, the exploration and the discovery. Miss Endicott put all this down and promised to amplify it in such a manner that would not trench upon Herrick's private affairs. Then he asked the girl about Colonel Carr. She was rather reticent on the subject. "'I do not feel that I am justified in speaking of the matter,' she said, shaking her head. "'All I can say is that Colonel Carr was better than his reputation. From what I can gather, he was murdered. Well, he expected to be, that is,' she broke off and flushed. "'He expected to be murdered?' Herrick looked keenly at her. "'Hush,' said Miss Endicott, with a glance at the door. I have no right to say that. It is a long story and not very clear. If you remain in Saxham, if we become better acquainted, I might. How long do you stay? It all depends upon my friend, replied Herrick, his curiosity at fever heat with these hints. He is still ill, I am afraid. I must go up and see him now. We shall meet again, I hope. I think so. I shall be at the inquest. And you? Of course. I must give evidence. Joyce also, if he is well enough. By the way, Bridge mentioned some relatives of Carr's. Who are they? Miss Marsh and her son, said the girl, with some reluctance. They live in Bishop's Close in Beerominster. It will be a great shock to them, although they were not on good terms with the Colonel. Will they be at the inquest? Mr. Marsh will be there, but his mother is very ill. She caught cold a day or two ago, and is now in bed with a sharp attack of pneumonia. Troubles never come singly, said Herrick sententiously. By the way, the suspicions of Bridge about Frisco. I am sure he is innocent, cried Miss Endicott, flushing. Frisco was bad, but he loved the Colonel. He would not have killed him. I, I. She suddenly shook her head, checked herself and walked out of the room. Herrick stared. Was it possible that this charming girl knew the truth? End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Verdict of the Jury Robin awoke calmer after his rest. The nervous excitement had passed away, but the reaction had left him as weak as a child. He looked shriveled up and pale when Herrick saw him. At once the doctor sat down to feel the little man's pulse, which was slow and faint. "'You must stay in bed today,' ordered the doctor, replacing his watch. "'I shall send you up some strong soup. Sleep as much as you can.' That is the best thing to pull you round. Should I not get up and look after this business with you? There is no need. The police have taken charge of the case. Your evidence is exactly the same as mine. So I shall represent you at the inquest. Is there to be an inquest? asked Joyce, with languid interest. Certainly, this afternoon at the house. From what Inspector Bridge told me, it would seem that Colonel Carr was shot on Tuesday night. Is the dead man's name Colonel Carr? Yes, wicked Colonel Carr. From all accounts, he was one of the worst. Why did he commit suicide? He did not, 
if bridge is to be believed he insists that the man was shot perhaps by a servant who has vanished however we shall hear all that is to be heard this afternoon a color crept into the wan cheek of joyce i should like to get up and hear all about it he said there might be material for a story you can hear details later on at present you must stay in bed until we return to town what about our walking tour i have decided to cut that short replied the doctor this adventure has given me a distaste for the trip in a day or so when you are rested we will return to london my practice is small but i must attend to it and what about me jim well reflected herrick you are now well enough off not to make work an imperative necessity i think you should go abroad for a time and do nothing until you are quite yourself explore italy or spain and don't do a stroke of work change of scene and company will make you your old self again in a short time never never moaned joyce i shall never get over her death nonsense don't give way robin you must be a man it was so sudden pleaded robin piteously i know didn't i attend her but apoplexy always ends suddenly your mother was a stout woman and took no exercise that fit might have been expected i warned her often you know i am sorry for your loss robin but sorrow will not bring back the dead you have your part to play in the world so you must put this grief behind you if i talk a little brutally you must excuse me to a man of your temperament sympathy is the worst thing possible in herrick's hands joyce was more or less of a child so he submitted rather against his will to remain in bed while his friend went forth to hear the news as might have been guessed robin employed his solitude in gloating over his sorrow this weakness he did not dare to reveal to jim fearing lest he should be lectured again still he could not but acknowledge to himself that herrick's advice was sensible meantime the doctor made a tour of the village the villagers swarming like bees in the excitement of the moment recognized a stranger and guessed that this was one of the two gentlemen said to have discovered the body hence herrick found himself the subject of considerable curiosity but was not molested or accosted in any way until he met with a clergyman this was on the outskirts of the village where a gorse covered common stretched up to the pine wood surrounding the house of colonel carr the parson seemed to have been wandering on the waste land for he appeared suddenly at herrick's elbow like a ghost probably he had seen the stranger coming and had just stepped out from behind a bush you are dr herrick he asked nervously jim signified that he was i am addressing the vicar he hazarded the rector corrected the other i am mr pentland corn you will excuse my breaking in on your meditations he continued but i guess that you were the finder of the body of our late lamented friend hmm. from all i have heard there is very little lamentation over the colonel's death scandal and evil tongues replied mr corn rather tautologically carr had his good points that is what miss endicott says indeed i was not aware that you knew miss endicott she came to the inn this morning to see inspector bridge about this wait said the reverend pentland in a hurry some mistake miss bess is the journalist her elder sister miss ida is the head of the family the nominal head i should say since miss bess manages everything the rector smiled as he spoke and herrick on account of that smile took rather a fancy to him the Reverend Pentland Corn, wonderful name, was something under forty, and looked more like a soldier than a parson. He had a smart soldierly figure, wore a mustache, and his hair cropped close. But for his clothes, Herrick would have taken him for a military man. He looked pale. There were dark circles under his eyes, and he seemed to be laboring under considerable stress of emotion. Perhaps the death of Carr had been too much for him. Yet after the first remark 
he shirked the subject and talked of the Endicotts. "'That is the proper name of the family,' said Corn hurriedly. "'Very old family in these parts. But Miss Bess calls her collective brothers and sisters the Biffs.' Dr. Jim smiled. There seemed to be something fascinating about the name, something characteristic of the girl he had met at the inn. The Biffs, he repeated, laughing outright. And how is that derived from the high-sounding name of Endicott? It is not derived from that at all, Dr. Herrick. It is simply the initials of the family. There are five of them, Bess, Ida, Frank, Flo, and Sidney. I see. Biffs. Huh. How amusing. Do they live near here? A quarter of a mile away at the back of my house. Sidney is my pupil, and a strange boy he is. But I have no business to tell all these things to a stranger, added Corn in confusion. Anything you say to me is perfectly safe, replied Herrick pleasantly. I think Miss Bess a clever young lady. And as good as she is clever. A great friend of the late Colonel's, I believe, said Jim. Pentland Corn moistened his dry lips. He was kind to her, was his reply, delivered in a faint voice. You will excuse my emotion, Dr. Herrick, but I am rather shaken by his death. Usually we are free from crime, and for this to happen in my parish, it is terrible. You knew Colonel Carr well? Very well. I tried to win him from his evil ways, but he was cut off in the midst of his sin. Oh, it is awful. Yet I liked him. He was a good friend to me on one occasion. The reason I stopped you was to ask if you met anyone in the house last night. No one. Myself and my friend hunted all over it. The servant bolted, I have been told. Frisco has certainly disappeared, responded Corn, looking at the ground. But I do not think he is the guilty person. He was devoted to the colonel. Then why did he run away? Ah, who can say? There was a mystery in Colonel Carr's life, Mr. Herrick, which I fear will never be cleared up. You will be at the inquest? Yes, it takes place at three this afternoon. And you, sir? No, I shall not be there. I cannot bear to. But that is neither here nor there, broke off Corn hurriedly. Tell me, was the house a light? Every room was lighted. It blazed like a palace in the wood. Colonel Carr's whim. He surrounded himself with the most beautiful things and installed the electric light. Water-powered, you know, added the rector, rather inconsequently. I expect the wheel was going constantly for two days before the body was discovered. Herrick recollected the murmur in the wood and now guessed that it came from the waterfall, which turned the wheel for the dynamos. There was no doubt that Colonel Carr surrounded himself with every comfort. Did he ever have guests to stay with him, he asked. The rector made a gesture of surprise. If you had known Colonel Carr, you would not ask such a question. He hated his fellow mortals. Then why had he so many bedrooms? I cannot tell you, but I am certain that he never had anyone to stay in the house. I have been in it once or twice myself, and Miss Bess has paid a visit but no other person has ever entered. Hmm. Quite a mystery. What about Marsh? I expect you heard of him from Miss Bess. He's a great friend of the Biffs. Stephen Marsh will inherit the Colonel's property, I expect. What relation was he to Carr? His nephew, but the two never spoke. They hated each other. Mrs. Marsh, then, is the Colonel's sister? Oh, dear me, no. The present Mrs. Marsh is only stepmother to Stephen. Violent, terrible woman with Italian blood in her veins. It was she, I think, who put Stephen against his uncle. She is very ill, I hear. Pneumonia. Dear me, said Corin, startled. Why, she was at my house on Tuesday. But it was raining when Stephen came for her. I expect she got a chill then. No doubt. At all events, she is seriously ill now, I understand. Ha, ah, said the rector, looking down again. I wonder if any doctor will attend her. She has quarreled with them all. Well, there is no more to be said, Dr. Herrick. By the way, if I have talked freely, you must excuse me for doing so. I have a reason, 
Some day I hope to tell it to you. Are you stopping here for long? A day or so. I'm on a walking tour with my friend Mr. Joyce. We return shortly to London. Good day, Mr. Corn. Good day, replied the rector, raising his hat, and slipped away into the gorse bushes like a ghost. Herrick walked on, somewhat puzzled. What was the meaning of this frank speech to a stranger? The parson looked smarter and more of a man of the world than many serious-minded people would have approved of. Yet he had talked, to say the least of it, in the most indiscreet manner. Moreover, he had promised, quite unnecessarily, to explain his reason for doing so to the doctor. What did it all mean? Does he know something as well as Miss Bess? thought Herrick, returning to the inn. Both of them seem to have a better opinion of Colonel Carr than the rest of the people. Hmm. I seem to be surrounded by mysteries here. Well, we shall see what the inquest will do. Robin proved more fractious than Herrick expected. He was most anxious to be present at the inquest, but in the end, overruled by the stronger will of his friend, he consented to remain where he was. The doctor walked by himself to the Pines, and was received by Inspector Bridge, who introduced him to the coroner, and to Dr. Tiller, who had examined the body. After some discussion, Bridge collected a jury of mixed villagers and Bureauminster citizens. After these had inspected the body, the witnesses were called. Herrick gave evidence of his discovery, of the position of the body and the condition of the house. He was followed by Tiller, who declared that, in his opinion, Colonel Carr had been shot on Tuesday night, going by the condition of the body. He flouted the idea of suicide. The shirt front was neither blackened nor singed, said Tiller, and it would have been had the deceased fired the revolver at so close a range. He was shot through the heart, and, as I believe, by someone who stood at the door. It seems to me that he was standing by the bed and heard a footstep on the stairs. At once he turned, only to meet the leveled revolver. The shot passed through his heart and embedded itself in the opposite wall. Again, there are three other shots in different parts of the body. One in the neck, another in the abdomen, and a third in the right leg. But the shot that killed the deceased was the first that went through the heart. "'How do you know that such a shot was the first? asked the coroner. "'From the examination of the wounds,' replied Tiller, "'the remaining three shots were fired when the man was down.' "'And dead,' said the coroner, aghast. "'Certainly. The deceased must have died almost instantaneously.' A thrill of horror passed through those present at the idea that the assassin had fired three more shots at the dead body. There was something horrible about the wrecking of such vengeance, and vengeance it must have been, for Bridge proved that no robbery had taken place. But the most interesting part of Bridge's evidence was yet to come. He produced the revolver found in the hand of the dead man. All six chambers proved to be loaded. Therefore, it would not have been this weapon which had been used. The idea of suicide was out of the question. Also, gentlemen, continued the inspector, the first shot was fired with a different weapon to that employed to fire the other three. The bullet which passed through the heart and embedded itself in the wall has been extracted. Here it is. The other three shots were found in the body and in the floor. Here they are. The pieces of evidence thus produced were placed before the jury. The first bullet was round, of the old-fashioned kind, fired from a muzzle-loading pistol. The remaining three were conical in shape, and of the most modern manufacture. Plainly, then, two pistols had been used, one of an antique pattern to fire the first shot, the shot which killed the colonel, and the other a revolver of the most modern type. And this latter had been merely employed to make a target of the dead body. Finally, said Bridge, after explaining all this, the third pistol, or rather revolver, found in the hand of the deceased was not fired at all. The chambers are loaded. There is no smoke stain on the barrels. 
It was simply put into the left hand of the dead man to hint at suicide. The person who did so knew that Colonel Carr was left-handed, but in his agitation forgot that the six chambers were loaded. In fact, he defeated his own scheme. This evidence was surprising enough. Why should the assassin use two pistols, when one would have sufficed? And, asked the coroner, why do you say he, Mr. Inspector? Do you then think that the guilty person is a man? I don't think a woman would have committed so brutal a murder, said Bridge bluntly. She would have been satisfied with killing the man and not have proceeded to mutilate the body. Also, the idea of putting a revolver into the hand of the dead would not occur to a woman. There I differ from you, Mr. Inspector, contradicted the coroner. A woman might do such a thing, and it is more likely a woman would forget in her agitation that the revolver was loaded than would a man in the like circumstances. Inspector and coroner argued out this point. At length, Bridge, losing his temper, stated that he believed Frisco shot his master and called Napper as a witness. The landlord stated that on Tuesday night at six o'clock, Frisco had been drinking rum at the Carr Arms. He seemed to be angry with his master, whom he alleged had treated him badly. As he left the inn about seven o'clock, he said, let him take care or he won't live long. At the time, Napper thought it was merely a drunken threat, but in the face of the death and Frisco's flight, he thought that the man was guilty. Of course, the coroner, who had lost his temper with Bridge, told Napper that he did not want his opinion, but simply his evidence. There was further trouble about this remark, in which the inspector got the worst of it. The final witness was Stephen Marsh. He was a tall, slight young man, with bowed shoulders and a pensive face. He stated that he had called on the evening of the murder for his mother at the rectory. She had been up at the Pines in the afternoon, and as she drove home, told him that Colonel Carr had expressed his intention of living for many a long day. Coroner. Why is Mrs. Marsh not here to give evidence? Marsh. My mother is seriously ill in bed and could not come. Coroner. Her evidence must be taken. Did she say how the conversation came about to induce the deceased to make such a speech? Marsh. Yes, my mother wanted the colonel to lend her some money. He refused. She said that he might as well, as when he died the estate would come to me. It was then that my uncle expressed his determination to live for many a long day. I merely give this evidence to show that my uncle had no thought of committing suicide. Coroner, have you seen your uncle lately? Marsh, no, not for six months. We were not on good terms. Coroner, how was it then that Mrs. Marsh called to see him on the afternoon of the murder? Marsh, she was determined to go. I asked her not to, but she insisted. At this reply there came a smile upon the faces of those of the jury who lived in Beelminster. Afterwards Herrick learned that Mrs. Marsh was well known as possessed of a violent temper, and there was no doubt, as someone remarked, that she had given the Colonel a good talking to. However, the evidence of Marsh did not point to what killed Carr. At the time there was no more available evidence. Bridge insisted that Frisco was guilty. He had left the house in the clothes he stood up in, evidently driven forth in a panic. He had made inquiries and had heard from the police at Southbury that Frisco, or a person answering to the description of Frisco, had gone to London by the morning train. At this moment Herrick asked to be allowed to give further evidence. He had just recollected they had seen such a man as was described. "'I was stopping at Southbury,' said Herrick, waiting for my friend Mr. Joyce, who had gone to London. He went up on Tuesday morning. I was stopping at the inn near the railway station. I got up early about seven to send a wire to my house in London.' I had to go to the telegraph office at the station. On the platform, 
I saw a stout man with a soft hat pulled over his face. He was dressed in a blue serge suit with a red tie, and looked like a sailor. I waited until the London train went, and saw him get into the third-class carriage. Coroner, how is it, Dr. Herrick, that you recollect this only now? Because I never thought of the matter before. Since Inspector Bridge has given a description of the dress, and especially the red tie, I am sure the man was Frisco. I did not see his face. The coroner was displeased with his evidence, and said so. In fact, he was a disagreeable man, with a strong animus against Bridge. As there was no more evidence, he summed up, trying to prove that Frisco could have had nothing to do with the murder. However, the jury were of a different opinion, and more sensible. So they brought in a verdict of willful murder against Frisco. This made the coroner ill-tempered again, and he left the Pines in a great rage. However, the verdict was given, the inquest was at an end, and the jury left the house. Stephen Marsh, as the nearest relative of the dead man, asked Bridge to allow the three policemen to remain in the house, as he had to return to his mother. Bridge consented, and then Marsh went up to Herrick, who was standing in the hall. Doctor, he said, will you come with me to Beerminster? I want you to attend my mother. Herrick stared. She is a doctor already, has she not, Mr. Marsh? Marsh shook his head. No, he replied in a low voice. No beer, Mr. Doctor, will attend her. Please come, sir, she is so ill. Although he was partly prepared for this explanation, Herrick could not help staring. What had Mrs. Marsh done that the medical fraternity at Beerminster should boycott her in this way? You are quite sure that no one will attend her? he asked incredulously. Perfectly. She has quarreled with all the doctors. I am very lucky to find you, Dr. Herrick, or I should be obliged to send to London or to Southbury. And we are so poor that the expense would be too much for us. You will come, I hope. Jim liked the young man's face. It was soft and mild, but remarkably handsome in a dark way. He could quite understand from such a face that a woman of imperious temper such as Mrs. Marsh appeared to be could dominate and bully her stepson. In fact, Stephen gave Herrick the impression of being crushed. It seemed to be Herrick's fate to meet with people who needed to be bolstered up. Witness Robin Joyce. Also, he had a shrewd suspicion that the Reverend Pentland Corn was of the weak type. The proverb says that some men come into the world booted and spurred, others saddled and bridled. Herrick was of the former type, and these three weaklings of the latter. However, in spite of his strong will and dominating character, Jim had a kind heart. He therefore consented to do Marsh the favor, he asked. But I must go first to the inn, he said. My friend is there, and I must see after him. I'll wait for you, said Stephen, but pray do not be long. I think my mother is dying. Nonsense, said Jim cheerily. I'll pull her round. Never give way. Marsh put out his hand and shook Jim's. I have wanted a friend for many a long day, he said. I believe I have found one in you. That's all right, Marsh. And so Jim took a second burden on his shoulder. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. At Beerminster. On their way to the inn, Herrick and his companion met Bess Endicott. She looked angry, and her eyes sparkled as she advanced towards the two men. "'Isn't it a shame?' she said rapidly. "'That verdict, I mean. I don't believe that Frisco killed the Colonel.' If he did not, there was no reason why he should have run away, replied Marsh. Well, cried Miss Endicott indignantly, I did not expect to hear you say that, Stephen. You know as well as I do that the Colonel always said that Frisco was in the same danger as he was himself. What danger was that? asked Herrick sharply. Bess hesitated, 
and seemed to regret that she had let her tongue wag so freely. But Marsh answered for her. We do not know what it was, he said simply, but my uncle always hinted that he had enemies. Frisco knew his secrets. We did not. And if that is the case, why should Frisco kill him? retorted Bess. However, what is done can't be undone. I suppose Frisco will be arrested. They'll have to catch him first, said Dr. Jim, a trifle grimly. And as the man has got away so rapidly, and is now lost in the wilderness of London, I expect they will have some difficulty in doing that. You are sure it was Frisco you saw at Southbury? Well, I did not see his face, but the clothes of the man at the station were the same in all respects as those described by Napper. I put everything down, said Miss Endicott, and now I am going home to Biffstead to put the article into shape. But I do not believe that Frisco is guilty. Who is? I do not pretend to know, but I intend to find out. What the police fail to do, you cannot best, said Stephen, wagging his head. But we must not wait. Dr. Herrick is coming with me to Beerominster. I'm so glad, cried the girl. It's a shame. None of the doctors seeing your mother. How lucky that Dr. Herrick is here. I shall see you again, doctor, shan't I? I have much to say to you. I shall call on you with pleasure, said Jim, gravely shaking hands. At Biffstead, I suppose. Both Stephen and Bess laughed. Oh, that is only my joke, said she. I call our family the Biffs and the house Biffstead. The Grange is where we live. Anyone can point out the place. Come when you can. As the two men resumed their walk, Herrick could not forbear expressing himself about Bess. What a clever girl she is, said he. Those eyes of hers twinkle like stars when she grows excited. You know the family, do you not, Marsh? I have known them all my life. We played together as children. Ida is my greatest friend. Herrick glanced a little jealously at the young man. I saw her by chance at Southbury, he said carelessly. She's very beautiful. Very, but not so clever as Bess. Bess is the head and tail and middle of the family. Were it not for her, it would go to pieces. But here we are at the inn. I'll wait for you here, Herrick. I won't be long, said the doctor, and ran up the stairs. As might be guessed, Robin, the selfish, was by no means pleased to be left alone. He did not want Jim to go to Beerminster, not even although the call was so imperative. What shall I do without you? he asked. You will go to sleep, replied Herrick calmly. Now no nonsense, Joyce. I have promised to see Mrs. Marsh, and I must keep my word. How long will you be? It all depends upon the state in which I find Mrs. Marsh. If she is very ill, I may stay all night. Good-bye, Robin. Good-bye, returned the little man, a trifle sulkily. There is far too much of the good Samaritan about you, Jim. You never think of that in relationship to yourself, said Herrick, with a laugh. I hope to be back this evening. Make yourself comfortable. As he ran down to rejoin Marsh, he could not help contrasting the two natures of Stephen and Robin. It is true that he had not had much experience of Marsh, but from what he had seen of him, he judged that he was of a grateful, kindly disposition. Joyce, on the other hand, although he looked upon Jim as his best friend, was selfish to the core. Herrick, from long association, and because he had plucked him back on one occasion from the grave, was attached to him. But he oft-times acknowledged that were not Robin an interesting case, from a medical point of view, as he undoubtedly was, he could not stand much of him. Still, he had been so long the little man's friend that he could not tear himself away from old associations. Nevertheless, Robin's yoke was beginning to gall, and Herrick was glad to get a day away from his society. Friendship is a tender plant and nothing kills it sooner than selfishness. But Robin, in his peevish self-satisfaction, had not the sense to see that. 
Do you mind going by the bus? asked Marsh with a flush. I am not rich enough to afford a cart of any sort. I am quite used to public conveyances, said Herrick gaily, and as to your being poor, the dark days are over now. I suppose so, replied Marsh thankfully. At least my uncle always told me that I was to be his heir, although we quarrelled so much. I have to take the name of Carr and fulfill certain duties. I do not know what they are, but I shall do them if only to get the money. I do so want to be rich. Ah, here's the bus. What about the will? asked Herrick, as they climbed up to the roof of the clumsy conveyance. Pardon me, perhaps I should not ask you. I do not mind in the least, said Stephen. Indeed, I am glad to find that you take an interest in me. I have had a lonely life. The Biffs are my only friends. By the way, who told you about the Biffs? Herrick described his meeting with Pentland Corn and the conversation that had ensued. He was remarkably confidential, said Herrick. That is strange, said Marsh thoughtfully. He usually keeps his mouth very much closed. However, he added in a lighter tone, we can talk of him again. At present, we will speak of the will. I have written to my uncle's solicitors, informing them of his terrible death. I expect to hear from them tomorrow or the next day, perhaps later. Who are your uncle's lawyers, or rather, I should say, yours? Firth and Firth of steel lane cheapside asked herrick in a tone of surprise yes do you know them i know of them they are the solicitors of my friend joyce that is strange said marsh gaily the world is very small after all is it not but i'm forgetting my mother he added sadly i was told that mrs marsh was your stepmother so she is but we get on very well together she is devoted to me. I expect you have heard of her violent temper. Well, I have, said Herrick hesitatingly. It seems to be well known, if you'll excuse my saying so. Oh, it's town talk, replied Stephen, with a vexed flush. But she is really a good, dear woman, and her own worst enemy. Since my father's death five years ago, she has been my best friend. Once she nursed me through a most serious illness. There are worse women in the world than my stepmother, Herrick, as you will find. She is a noble-looking woman, and I am glad to be rich, if only for her sake. She is fond of luxury, but for my sake has borne poverty. And we have been very, very poor, finished Stephen, with a sigh. Every word the young man uttered revealed his good heart. Jim was pleased to find such an unsophisticated youth for once in his life. The young men he knew were usually old before their time, and took a pride in being so. But Marsh talked with such candor that Herrick saw he was as simple as the day. "'You are a good fellow, Marsh,' said Jim. "'I am glad to have met you.' "'I echo your compliment,' said the other. "'But here we are at Beerminster. I hope my mother is no worse. The vehicle stopped at the foot of the hill upon which the cathedral was built. Herrick followed his companion up a winding street, as steep as those at Malta, and after a breathless climb found himself in the great square. The vast fabric of the cathedral rose black against a saffron sky, and the bells were ringing for the evening service. Stephen led the way towards a far corner of the square, and turned into a dingy side street sloping down the other side of the hill. Stopping at a tall, narrow house three doors down, he admitted himself by means of his latch-key, and conducted his companion into a dark passage. A woman with a candle held high above her head appeared at the end. She was very old, with white hair and fierce black eyes. A foreigner, as Herrick guessed. "'How is my mother, Petronella?' asked Stephen hurriedly. "'Ah, gran Dio! Bad, very bad, signor,' replied the old Italian. "'She die if no doctor come.' "'I have brought one, Petronella.' "'Thanks be to the saints,' cried Petronella, 
This way, Señor Doctore. My Señora is up the stair. Piano, piano. She is bad, so bad. Piano. Herrick suppressed a laugh. The piano, piano of Petronella, reminded him of the opening chorus in the Barber of Seville. However, he recovered his grave air when introduced into the bedroom of Mrs. Marsh. A very few minutes' examination convinced him that she was extremely ill. Her pulse was rapid, she was in a high fever, and her face looked scarlet. Still she was conscious, and when the doctor had finished with her for the time being, she beckoned to her stepson. "'The death, the examination,' she asked hoarsely. "'The jury have brought in a verdict of willful murder against Frisco.' In spite of the pain she was suffering, Mrs. Marsh sank back on her pillow with a smile. "'I always thought that man would kill Carr some day,' she muttered. "'Who is the doctor, Stephen?' Marsh detailed all he knew about Herrick while that gentleman was giving directions to Petronella. His stepmother listened attentively and nodded when he finished. "'I am glad that he had the decency to come,' she said. "'These wretches here should be punished by the law. I don't want to die now. There's a chance of being comfortable for the rest of my life. You must not talk, Mrs. Marsh, said Herrick, coming to her bedside, and I think your son had better go downstairs. Am I very ill? asked the woman. Oh, you are not so bad as you might be, replied Jim cheerfully. Do not excite yourself, obey my directions, and you will be all right shortly. I suffer such pains, moaned Mrs. Marsh. I can get no sleep. Chloral. What's that? asked Herrick sharply. Chloral or morphia. Give me something to soothe the pain. I'll see to it, said the doctor cheerfully, and looked at the handsome face of his patient. He saw that she was a highly strung woman, and from the words she had used he guessed that she was in the habit of taking chloral to induce sleep. Mrs. Marsh was the kind of person who would end her days in a madhouse, if not soothed, by artificial means. From the passionate expression in her eyes, the wrinkles on her face, her impatient gestures, Herrick saw that she had absolutely no control over her temper. Perhaps the rumors he had heard of her influenced such a judgment, but afterwards he found that he was absolutely right. The outbursts of rage to which Mrs. Marsh was subject were little removed from madness. The only person who could deal with her was Petronella, who, as Herrick learned, had been her nurse and knew how to manage and humor her. "'I shall stay here all night,' he said to the Italian, after certain remedies had been applied. "'Make up a bed for me somewhere, and send out to the chemist for this prescription to be made up. It was late when Jim descended. He found Stephen waiting for him at the foot of the stairs, and was conducted by him into a small bare room, sparsely furnished with two armchairs, a few books, and a table covered with writing materials. Herrick, rather tired, threw himself into one of the chairs and informed Stephen that he would stay the night. "'Is my mother so ill?' asked the young man anxiously pretty bad, but I've seen worse cases. Don't you trouble yourself, Marsh. I'll do the best I can to save her life. Save her life, echoed Stephen sadly. Ah, what a terrible thing it will be if she dies now, when wealth is coming. She always wanted to be rich, and now life is very cruel. That depends upon the way you look at it, said Jim. Give me some supper, Marsh, and a whiskey. I feel rather played out. The meal was waiting in a poverty-stricken looking dining room. Jim saw that the pauperisms of the marshes was no fiction. They were evidently terribly poor. Certainly the colonel had done nothing to alleviate their distress. He would not give us a penny, said Stephen, after supper, and when they were smoking in the small room, which proved to be the young man's special sanctum. All the time he kept telling me that I was his heir but refused to help my mother and me. I do not want to speak evil of the dead, added Stephen, but Colonel Carr, he shook his head. 
By this time Herrick had seen his patient sinking into a sleep, and leaving Petronella to call him should anything go wrong, was prepared for a little conversation. He utilized the time by asking Marsh about himself and his uncle. The young man answered him with the utmost frankness, and indeed seemed glad to have a friend in whom he could confide. My father was a gentleman farmer, he said, but he attended more to pleasure than to business. While out hunting, he saved the life of Miss Carr, the colonel's sister. Afterwards, she married him. I was her only child, for my mother died when I was born. My father lost all his money from reckless living and went abroad for economy. In Italy, he met my stepmother, who is the daughter of an English consul by an Italian mother. He met her in a little town on the Adriatic coast. Her father was dead, and she was alone save for Petronella. It was her intention to become a singer, but she fell in love with my father. He brought her home to Beerminster, along with Petronella, who would not leave her. With what remained of his money, my father bought this house. Five years ago he died, leaving my mother two hundred a year. With his freehold and that income, we have managed to scrape along. I was educated at Bedford and afterwards went to Oxford. My father said that though he could give me no money, he could at least afford me a decent education. I believe he pinched himself to do so. Mrs. Marsh helped me, for she has always been good to me. I was twenty-one years old when my father died, and after the funeral I wanted to go to London and become a journalist. Mrs. Marsh, however, would not hear of this. She insisted that I was the Colonel's heir, and that I should wait until he died. Ah, interrupted Herrick, shaking his head, bad thing waiting for death man shoes. Do you think it was my wish to do so? protested Stephen, passionately. I should have much preferred to earn my own living and fight my way in London. I have some talent as a poet and a writer, and I was prepared to battle with the world like other people. But Mrs. Marsh made me stop with her. I am twenty-six years of age now, and I have done nothing. I write poetry and send it to the American magazines, also a few prose articles. These keep me supplied with pocket money. It was Bess who put me on to the New York papers. There the editors are more open to new talent. And the Colonel refused to help you? Always. But I never asked him. I hated that man, said Marsh between his teeth. I never went near his house. At times my mother called to see him. She always fought viciously with him. And I think he liked her for that. Most people were afraid of him, and he admired her for standing up to him. Colonel Carr thought me a fool and a weakling because I stayed with Mrs. Marsh instead of going out into the world. But I ask you, Herrick, what else could I have done? Mrs. Marsh has always been good to me. She sacrificed much so that I might be well educated. So the least I could do was to stop with her. Again and again I wanted her to come with me to London. But she always refused. I understand, said Jim, filling his pipe. She wished to keep an eye on the colonel. I think so. Carr always said that I was to be his heir. He has no relative but me, and he was reported to be wealthy. I should think so, Marsh. That house is filled with treasure. Did he inherit his money? Stephen looked up alertly. Ah, now... You are touching on the secret of Carr's life, he said with some excitement. His father died ruined, and left him nothing but the pines with a few acres of farm and corn land. Do you know how old Colonel Carr was, doctor? No, I saw him only after his death. Not very old, I should say. Just sixty, replied Stephen, and into his life he crammed enough wickedness to fill a century. He was twenty when his father died and in the army. By gambling and speculating, he supported himself and left his sister, my mother, in that old ruined house. Afterwards he left the army. 
cashiered for cheating at cards, and led a hand to mouth existence. But he would never sell the pines, however hard up he was. He stopped there on occasions and played the devil all round. I can't tell you how bad he was. It is the common talk of the countryside. He was called Mad Carr and Wicked Carr. Colonel Carr put in Herrick. No, he was only a captain when he left the army at the age of thirty. I believe he called himself Colonel when he returned ten years ago. From what quarter of the world? Marsh shook his head. I cannot tell you, he said slowly. For twenty years Carr vanished from England. My mother was left behind in the old house, and afterwards married my father. She should have made a better match, but she had little money and the reputation of her brother did her no good. However, she married my father, and afterwards died when I was born. That was the end of her. The colonel left his lawyers to look after the property and remained away. I always heard that it was in South America he picked up his money. At all events, he returned here ten years ago with plenty of cash. The first thing he did was to put the house in order and fill it with splendid furniture. He engaged a staff of servants and wanted to entertain. At first the people were disposed to be friendly, but he went on worse than ever, and everybody cut him. In a rage, he sent away all the servants and only kept Frisco. Did Frisco come back with him from South America? Yes, but whether it was South America or North I cannot say. Frisco could hold his tongue when he chose. However, Carr turned his back on the country people and went on worse than ever. He was said to be mad, but I think it was merely devilment myself. One queer thing he did. No, two queer things. The building of the tower was one, said Herrick shrewdly. Marsh nodded, and the other mad act was the throwing down of the walls and fences around the pines. Dr. Jim looked puzzled. Hmm, said he. I noticed that the house had no fences round it. One came upon it suddenly, as if it had been dropped from the skies. Carr threw down the walls to show that he was not afraid. On the other hand, he must have built the tower to show that he was. I do not understand what you mean. Why, it is not difficult, if you remember what you said to me when we met that girl. You hinted that Carr was afraid of something in which Frisco was concerned. Well, then, evidently, his first attitude was one of defiance towards this fear. Afterwards, he thought better of it and built the tower. A man would not leave that splendid house to sleep in a bare room at the top of a tower unless he was afraid. I think you are right, said Stephen, musingly but I don't know what he was afraid of. It was the third year after he returned that he built the tower, and he was in such a hurry to get it done that he had the men working at it by night. You know he has a magnificent system of electricity round about the pines. Well, the lights were on night after night until the tower was finished, and relays of workmen replaced one another. The whole county wondered at the way Carr went on. He gave no explanation. No, he saw no one, but shut himself up like a hermit. Frisco attended the house and cooked the colonel's meals. But I think Carr often cooked for himself. He was fond of cooking. For eight years, he never went outside that house. Hmm. That accounts for the gymnasium, the bowling alley, and the shooting gallery. What about his business? He did it all by means of letter, Firth and Firth, sent down a clerk occasionally. Carr was a clever man of business, and invested his money in good securities, so my mother said. She used to beard him in his den. And the clergyman, Corn? Yes, he called also to try and reform the colonel, but he did not succeed. A good fellow, Corn, but weak. Can hold his tongue, though. On the contrary, he talked a good deal to me. So you said, muttered Stephen. I wonder what he meant by that. Did he know the secret of Carr's life? Not that I know of. 
Corn always kept his mouth shut, as I said. Why should he have talked openly to you, I can't say. It seems to me that there are mysteries on all sides, said Herrick with a shrug. Miss Bess used to visit Carr, you say? She did once or twice, but I shall leave her to tell you of her visits and her opinion of her host. Marsh, said Dr. Jim after a pause, have you any idea who murdered Carr? No, not the remotest, unless it was Frisco. On the face of it, one would think so. Why did Frisco run away? Stephen rubbed his chin. I think we must ask Bess, said he, thoughtfully. If anyone knows what is at the back of all this, it is Bess Endicott. End of chapter 4